started marketing on a credit card. I showed up with five t-shirts and five hats. I put it all on a credit card. I maxed out the credit card to 20K and I rolled the dice. I showed up to the first ComplexCon not knowing what ComplexCon would be. And, you know, I remember just like that first day doing, you know, I think it was like 15K and the next day doing another wow. 15K. And then I was like, holy shit. I remember going back to the hotel room, my girlfriend who had helped me with the booth and like, you know, we're both just sitting there. That's real being money. Like, this is crazy. Like I had like, you know, probably like a thousand dollars in like in cash and I had like was on the bed, I threw the money up. Like it was one of those moments where like after all the pain, all the yeah. struggle, all that, like questioning myself, like, am I even, can I do this again? Do I actually matter? Like, did anyone care about what I make? And that was like, oh, I can do this, you know? And that was like the renewing of that energy of just like, oh, I'm here and I'm here to fucking stay. I'm Tom Ward and over the last couple years, I've had the chance to sit down with some of the biggest celebrities and influencers in the world. What I've always found most fascinating is the stories of the businesses that they've built behind the scenes. On this show, you'll get an inside look of what it takes to build a successful business from some of the biggest celebrities, business people, and up and coming entrepreneurs in the world. This is the Tom Ward Show. Guys, welcome to the Tom Ward Show, where we talk to the biggest entrepreneurs in the world. And today I have such an entrepreneur. We have Mike Sherman, founder of The Market, or Market, yep. the uh, streetwear brand that just came off of a very successful complex con. It's it's funny, we were talking before, it's easy to see you now, and you've got this great booth at complex con, and you got For a sure. successful brand, yep. and you're rich, and you have famous <laughs> friends, and all this cool stuff. But that's not the most interesting thing, at least to me. The interesting thing to me is kind of the struggle, which talk about totally but it seemed like you have the hustle which i i don't believe can be taught i think it's something you either have or you don't if you don't sorry you can work to get better but some people are just wired different and they're mowing lawns in their neighborhood at 10 years old no one's telling them i yeah. read somewhere that they called you mikey merch or yeah, something mikey, in high school what mikey merchandise so i so what, what's that about so i you know when i moved from new york to california when i was a freshman in high school i had no friends i had you know, like got myself a Mac computer. I had bootlegged the Adobe suite and I had basically just sat in my room and taught myself that stuff when I had first moved. Cause you know, you don't know anyone, you're not out doing stuff. And for me, that was my salvation. So I think, you know, starting out, it was just like making t-shirts with printer paper. I bought it off his depot and then going and ironing them on t-shirts that I had in my house. And, you know, step by step, you start kind of learning the process, but you know, it really kind Were of- Were you selling them? Yeah. So, I mean, I was starting to try to sell them. You know, you go to Buffalo Exchange and sell your shirt for five, 10 bucks or, you know, you figure out like, hey, I'm going to make a website and two people buy the shirt, <laughs> um, you know, but I think that those were all of the learning lessons for me to understand how to do it. I think that, you know, it all really kind of hit ahead when I was a, I think, sophomore in high school. I had made this shirt of a kid in my school and um, basically made 50 of them. It was just this kind of like wild design. Um, I used this image, had him sign a release. And I mean, <laughs> was I he a popular I, kid? How'd you pick you this know kid what? out? He just like made this funny face and like I like <laughs> thought it'd be a cool shirt and okay. you know, whatever and made 50 of them. They sold out. This kid didn't end up getting one of the shirts. He fought a kid on campus for the shirt. <laughs> I ended up in the principal's <laughs> office and I was basically being talked to as if I was selling and distributing on campus. Mm -hmm. And the same thing that you would talk to a kid about selling drugs. Yeah. But I was selling t-shirts, you know? And so, you know, that night it was like, you know, I took a photo <laughs> of myself on the school fence holding the bars and like, you know, I was like almost expelled from school. My parents had to come in. Oh, it was a whole thing. But, you know, pulling myself back, that was the first time in my life that someone had acknowledged or reacted to something that I had made in a visceral way. And it was like that first kind of validation for me to say, oh, like people care about something that I'm making. And I think that that was like the first moment for me. You know, I'd worked at Jamba Juice. I worked at a taco shop in high school. I've had the very run of the mill jobs, but like that felt like it sparked that level of joy in me, not to Marie Kondo things, but I'm like, yeah. you know, that really sparked joy for me. That really made me happy. And I think like I kept now chasing that high of like, how can I make things that make people react, make them smile, make them happy and like, that brings me joy every day. Was that the first thing you were also like the best at or really good at? I mean, were you like the best baseball player on your team as a kid or were you the smartest kid in class? I'm guessing you this know is what? the first thing that you were like kick ass at. Yeah, because you it? know what? I think it's like anything in life. You you want to go play college basketball. I wanted to go I play to. tennis as a kid, you know, whatever. <laughs> yeah. I didn't make the tennis team so cool. I quit tennis. I <laughs> yeah. made the basketball team. I played until I was a junior in high school. Then I broke my hand and I was like, 
you know what? Maybe I don't need to play, you know, basketball anymore. I smoked a little bit of weed and I started making T-shirts, you know, and like it was just paid off. Yeah. But you know what? Like it was it was exactly like what you said. I think it was the first time I felt like I was really good at something mm -hmm. that I felt like I could be better than other people at this. And that if I just kept going, I could do something special. You know, I found a few friends who were into the same thing. We would all kind of share different kind of knowledge and things together. And at the time, it was just like looking at these brands on the internet, being inspired, trying to emulate what they do. What brands and, were you inspired by at the time? What were you into? I mean, it's so silly, but it's like worlds like, you know, like at the time I was really into like the Warp Tour and, yes, you know, no. just like, I don't know, just so much new music that I was into. And I discovered this like so random, but a brand called Full Bleed, this guy named Rob Doby, or there was a brand called Johnny Cupcakes or even early The Hundreds, um, oh, wow. Diamond Supply Co. Yeah, and like. Yeah early just streetwear that I think like blew my mind. You know, it was like, oh, I could like put graphics on a t-shirt and I could sell it. Like this is, you know, so cool. And I'd grown up with parents who were in the fashion business, but in stuff that I didn't care about. My dad Ooh, sold girls denim. My wow. mom was a designer, but they oh. made women's wear. You know, they didn't do young kids streetwear. I didn't really care about the things that they were doing until way later. Mm -hmm. But, you know, for me, it was those that discovery of just making and creating that I think just validated everything in life. And I was like, how can I just do this forever? So then you go to Parsons School of Design, right? Was that like the, okay, are kids into this? Son, you have to go to school. And you're like, okay, this seems like the coolest school that'll kind of teach me what I want to know. You know what? Is that Part how of that it came was about? my parents kind of saying to me, like, you got to figure out what you want to do. Like if you don't go to college, you're going to community college, you yep. know, or, you know, I don't know what's going to happen. And for me, it was like, I applied to two schools. I applied to the Fashion Institute of Technology in New York and I applied to Parsons. I didn't get into FIT, which to me was the lesser good, like, mm -hmm. you know, better school. And then Parsons, which I got into, um, but I didn't get a scholarship, you know? So my parents were like, you have a year, we have enough to be able to help you for that. But after that, you got to figure it out, you know? And for me, that was my ticket out. That was my way to get to New York, to be able to see opportunity, to get my feet wet. And ultimately, you know, that was the opportunity to me more than going to school was being in New York, being around these type of people and, you know, flashing forward. Like there is very few people that I'm still in touch with from the Parsons community who are actually doing stuff in the industry. Um, and I find a lot of times that it was the people who were doing stuff outside of school that is what made their life different. And for me, I went to school all day and then I went to my internship and job after work and I spent hours after work doing, you know, freelance, et cetera. And I spent all of my time, those 10,000 hours, which is probably 50,000 hours at this point. Yeah. But it's just like doing it every day, you know, and truly like living, breathing and like just doing it as my life. You know, like I truly was like, I'm a graphic designer now. And as much as like we can all tell ourselves stuff, you have to convince yourself that this is who you are. Otherwise, like you're going to waffle on like, what you're doubling down on every day. Mm -hmm. So you drop out after a year, the million dollar question, right? That I'm sure somebody watching this has it. Do you need college? If you want to get into fashion or be an entrepreneur, what do you think? You did a year. It sounds like it didn't I really don't, get you where you needed to go. I don't believe that it's the tool to, you know, help you make a million dollars or to go get a great job. There are certain industries. My brother's a lawyer. Like, you, you know, he had to go to college for him to be able to get a, you know, great job. And frankly, he went to Cordoza School of Law and he wasn't getting offers from cool places. And he went to NYU graduate school for law. And then he got big ass offers from the companies who didn't even talk to him before. Mm -hmm. Right. So that is, I think, a nuanced thing in, in this answer is like there are a lot of things in this world you do need to go to school for. You True. need to go to the right places. And frankly, the positioning of the right school will get you the right access you want. But I find in fashion, especially mm -hmm. and especially nowadays that the tools are more democratized. Access to, you know, things is way more democratized. Like rewind 10 years ago, cultural institutions are the barrier for you to get into these things. Mm -hmm. But nowadays, you know, people on YouTube and, you know, access online is so much more real. So the knowledge is out there and it's really on people to say, I want to do this and this is who I am. Mm -hmm. And I'm willing to take that risk because so many people are going to quit after no one reacts to the first thing that they put out or, you know, et cetera, because consistency I found is the only, you know, kind of way to breed success, mm -hmm. you know, because I swear showing up every day. Yeah. Because like, there are so many times where I'm like, no one cares, no one's watching, you know, et cetera. Like I didn't just launch my first brand and have tons of sales. I didn't just go out. Like 
I started my first brand, ICNY. You know, my friend had a booth at the Brooklyn flea market, and I showed up with a table with 24 pairs of reflective socks on it because I got hit by a car riding my bike in New York, and I wanted to keep like make something to keep myself safe. But that experience was the first way of cutting my teeth, hand-to-hand -hand sales, meeting people, like you know, telling them about my product, showing them my passion. My passion was the thing that was selling them the stuff. And then ultimately, the head buyer of Urban Outfitters walked into the flea market saw the socks wow. and then I became friendly with him and then down the road we ended up working together he was working with us at market and you know he's gone off and he's now the chief merchant at backcountry but you know those are the type of relationships that I think happen naturally through this stuff and you can't just plan or position yourself to be in it mm -hmm. but it's showing up every time it's being willing like every Saturday I was there at the flea market every time I was you know there selling I was pushing hard and just trying to keep showing up because that's the only way that anyone buys into anything. You can tell me you're a chef as long as you keep doing it every day. Sure. But you know, like you're doing this because you woke up every day saying, I want to interview exciting, interesting people. <laughs> Five and, years grinding you know, it out. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And like, you Paying know, out of pocket. For sure. Nobody cared. <laughs> and that's the thing that I think no one realizes is like, this was built, you know, initially, like I pulled a credit card out and I put 20 K on that credit card, showed up to complex Com with five t-shirts and five hats. And you know, I pretty much took a huge risk. One of the shirts was a bootleg shirt that said Frank Ocean with a yeah, Nike yeah. swoosh. And, you know, that day at the first Complex Con, that shirt sold out in 20 minutes. I had 75 of them. But that moment, I was like, this could be a thing. <laughs> and so that night, I went home, I bought swoosh Frank Ocean or swoosh frankocean.com. And then I put up the website. I sent it to my friend at Hypebeast. They posted it. And the next morning, I woke up my phone was just vibrating viscerally. And I was just like, what is going on? And then I saw these Shopify notifications coming in, did like 50K in sales in less than 24 hours. But then six hours later, I got you know a trademark infringement from Frank. Of course. I had to return all the money uh, uh. because I was just like <laughs> panicking, like I'm gonna, of I'm, course. I'm screwed. Cease like, and desist. Yeah, yeah, trademark infringement. Scary. I'm like, oh, they're gonna ruin my life. Yeah. I didn't have for them to take, you know? <laughs> but looking back at it, I'm like, man, but that, risk and that kind of approach to creativity is what opened my eyes to say, if I could just do this legally, move the speed of the internet, have an idea in the morning, put it online by noon and ship it out the next morning, I have something special, yep. you know? And I understand how to design it, to make it, to ship it. I understand the entire process because I did it all, you know? And when I worked at this Nike customization store, when I dropped out of Parsons, I was basically a kid in the basement, you know, making custom varsity jackets for Kanye, Amari Stoudemire, random like athletes and musicians and just like cool whatever people. But that experience was every day I was in a basement like doing something different, embroidery, screen printing, digital printing, you know, you name it. And I was just going through that process of how to do it. And so the 10,000 hours of just designing, the 10,000 yep. hours of making and the 10,000 hours of just creating, you know, I was a kid where you sat down with me and said, I want to drag a dunk into basketball on the back of this jacket. And I would literally design it for you in five minutes, turn my computer around and be like, this is what it'll look like. And then in two weeks, you'll have that finished piece and it'll be done. Yeah. Right. But that process is so rare for people in this industry where I think a lot of people just sit behind computers and send tech packs out to China. And then everyone's like, made in China is bull. And I'm like, actually, it's the American designers who usually suck and they don't understand how to make anything with their hands. So they can't actually tell someone how to do it themselves. Yeah. And that's usually the big disconnect on why global production or things like that are looked at so shitty. Because as far as I'm concerned, you can make a really shitty product in Japan, in Italy, in any of these countries that yeah. are really, really great. But you can also go to a great factory and get something amazingly made. Yeah. So two sides of every coin. And I've always found this industry is very convoluted from like the almost like ways that people talk about where things are made, who does them, et cetera, and the value behind them because mm -hmm. it's it's all marketing. It's funny, it, um, I'm not connected to the streetwear brand at all, but I got I got a chance to meet um, Ruigi yep. from Rude and his story is great too. His story is just like yours where he put in his 10,000 hours and <laughs> except it was different. He didn't have the Frank Ocean moment. He put up a site, priced it at a premium price point for a shirt no one bought anything for three months and he, he said i actually went in and bought my own first shirt for 250 bucks just to see if the site was working or not yep you 100%, know percent man but he was showing up every single day and just yep. had some belief some weird belief and i don't know where that comes from because i eventually got that but on paper it makes no sense did you like do you ever are you curious where that belief in yourself came from like that 
Yeah, yeah, of course selling reflective socks would work. I'm guessing. I don't know anything about fashion, but I'm sure you weren't the first person to put reflective tape on socks. I'm sure there were other ones out there. The funny thing was, I was. Were you really? Yeah. You know, Get out like, of here. I, I, you know, there was people selling ankle bracelets that you could wrap around your pants. Yeah. So yeah. Your pants wouldn't get into the gears of your bike or, no one made you know, it. things like that. But I was the first person to put reflective tape onto socks. Um, you know, get the first person to really punch before Levi's had a Le Levi's commuter brand, before yeah. a lot of that stuff. Like, I had designers at Nike buying my socks and referencing in them. And all of a sudden, Leo Chang, a designer at Nike, designed the KD reflective socks. And the dude was buying my socks offline, at, you know, a couple months before, or a year sure. before. So, you know, all that to say, yes, there was reflective clothing for cycling, 100%. Oh, okay. But it was this idea of, you know, lifestyle meets performance. Mm -hmm. The idea that, like, I'm not just wearing this stuff to ride a bike, but I'm wearing it all day because for my life in the New York, you know, in New York City, it was like, I want to get off my bike, go into work, work all day, jump on the bike, go home. Yep. Not feel like all of a sudden I have one outfit to do it and then one outfit to live. Yep. You know, and I think that was the fluidity of like, oh, every time I was going to buy bike stuff, it was like made for cycling, made for the intense road. But a lot of times I was like, I'm just living a commuter city lifestyle. I just need something for me. But back to what you said about Rigi and, you know, Rude, I think that it's a lot of this stuff. It's almost having a little bit of a ignorance to what's happening, right? Because like you have to believe in yourself before anyone else will, you know, and that is the most important thing deep down. Because but the person watching this goes, I mean, self-doubt's a killer. I mean, all of us deal with it, right? Yeah. So where does that belief or do you have any tips on believing in yourself when like Ruigi, no one bought a shirt. I go, dude, I would have shut down shop personally. I would have been so in the dumps. I would have never made it to three months. I would have dropped my price immediately. I wouldn't have had the balls to go, no, it's worth 250. I would have gone, ah, sell for 40. You know, let's do, let's panic. It's where do you have that? I mean, I mean, it's, any tips for people getting to deal with it? You know, I think the, the one thing is for me is it's truly knowing deep down that like you have to keep showing up like it is the consistency it's like there's been nothing else during my life that's worked other than continuing to show up you know and like that continued practice has bred results i think that for anyone to think that there's just some cheat code or someone you're going to go talk to that's going to help you break that barrier mm -hmm. it's hard because you're never going to know the day that it's going to happen or the person who's going to buy it or the thing that's going to help tweak things in the right way you know like it was for me like selling to Urban Outfitters gave me the access to, for a rapper to buy the shirt or for a stylist to get it. Like I didn't know cool stylists or cool people. I didn't know all the guys in the industry. Like I really, you know, when I started out, it was just like, here's my stuff. I'm posting about it. Like, but the whole mentality for me was like, I was already designing for brands. I was already doing freelance graphic design. And so for me, it was the natural next step, Okay, you know? And so... I had done it for everyone else. So now let me do it for other, for my myself. Mm -hmm. And I think that I remind everyone, like, if you want to go start a brand and you don't know how to do it, I suggest you maybe go and be around some people who know how they how to do it that's what and you go did. and learn. And yeah. so I would say that's my biggest suggestion for anyone is like, walk before you run, go try to learn from someone else. Go put yourself in a position where don't just get an internship at a cool big company, but go find a mentor and go find someone who's going to be willing to put you in the situations for you to meet more people, learn more, et cetera. And what you give them in return is your time and your energy, mm -hmm. you know? And what I found is that, you know, when I went to Parsons, I was working at a company called Goodwood that made all wooden jewelry, you know, chains. They made these like Jesus pieces, okay. crazy thing. But I ended up meeting a guy who at the time was just a, you know, manager of a Japanese streetwear store in New York City. He ended up becoming ASAP Rocky's manager. Um, wow. But I met him through, you know, I would go make the chains on the side for him and I'd go deliver it to him after work. And then I'd go sit with him and we'd go, you know, chop it up talking about stuff and then i was like hey i could help you graph design made his logo did his designs and then i ended up making the asap worldwide logo for oh, asap wow. rocky um but that was like my first opportunity right of like yo i could do it for you and then being with him i ended up meeting the editor-in-chief of complex this guy noah callahan Bever, who does like a really cool like interview series but i did his website and his logo and then you know just met other people did their stuff did their merch and it was just like any opportunity i could i was like 100 bucks 200 bucks like whatever i could do to do something for someone else yep and then ultimately it was like while i was working there i you know my parents were like yo do you want to move home like you're you, school's done like you're there for the summer we're letting you have an opportunity and I basically decided like Jeff Staple, who is a guy in streetwear who basically I had looked up to, he had a store next next to the shop that I was working at. And so 
I basically decided to make a poster campaign from where Jeff lived to where he worked and covered the entire path of those streets with huge posters that I printed in the Parsons Print Lab. So I basically got all my friends with their leftover print credit from the year, printed these massive large format posters. It was a poster that said, hi, my name is Mike. I want to work for you. And it basically had like Google voice number. I was just like, you know, I wrote a little bio about myself and I covered everything. I knew that he lived above his store and I knew that their offices were down the street. So I did all that, you know, put up all the posters. And then that night I'm going in the subway and this dude taps me on the shoulder. He's like, yo, what are those? I'm like, oh, dude, I'm like trying to get the job with this guy. And he's like, cool, put your hands behind your back. That's graffiti, um, you know, et cetera. And that was basically, you know, a cop undercover who was basically busting me for wheat paste posting in New York. So, you know, fast forward, I'm in, you know, Central Holdings it's called the Tombs. Uh, and I'm like, you know, sitting there with like chinos and a button down shirt. I was at job interviews all day because I was trying to get a job to like stay in New York. Um, and I'm looking at guys who were like, I swear I didn't know guns were illegal in New York. I didn't try to kill my girlfriend. Like, I'm like looking at all this, like, what am I doing here? But, you know, I got out and the next day I had seen like blog posts and people talking about shameless self-promotion. This idea of me being unafraid to put myself out there to go take that opportunity to stick my neck out and say hey this is who i am i want to work with you and i think that that approach while i unconsciously made that decision was a strategic way to get the attention of people that i wanted to work with i ended up getting an interview with jeff where he sat down and said to me you're not just going to come in here and be a designer mm -hmm. you're not just going to come in here and you know do the stuff you're going to sweep floors you're going to get coffee like i don't know what you think this is and at the time i was pissed i was like I just got arrested. Like, you're not going to yeah. hire me. Yeah. Like, I was ready to work, yeah. you know? And Don't that, you know how talented I am? And, you know, and I, I had a little bit of a chip on my shoulder because I'm like, all the shit I went through. But that was the best thing that could have happened to me at that time because fast forward, I ended up sitting down with Jeff two years later, collaborating with him with my brand and his brand. How cool Right? And being able to have that 360 moment to say, you know what, if he had hired me, maybe he wouldn't have respected me as much and I wouldn't have gotten to this point to be eye to eye with him. I mm -hmm. would have always been here. And I think that that was a big moment for me to say like, oh, I had to keep going. Even in that moment where I'm like, this is my opportunity. I got arrested and now I, I should have this. Like, no, I shouldn't. Like, that's not just how it comes. And, you know, I had to keep on getting back up and getting back up. And so, you know, kept on building that brand. You know, I had found an investor who was able to help me. I met a guy who did the, you know, t-shirt printing for Supreme and, you know, a bunch of other cool brands. And at the time I was like, you know, enamored by this. And I was like, oh, this guy can help me. And, you know, got into it. The guy didn't know anything about building a brand, about building, you know, did he finance other businesses. Your yeah, ICM but he financed it. I gave him half the business. At one point he had invested over a million dollars and, wow. you know, he was like, I need to own it. And I was like, cool, we're going to build something bigger, you know, and then sign 51% over to him. And I'd say maybe six months later, I saw, you know, my email got shut off. All of a sudden, I'm going to start work that day. And I'm like, something's weird here. And then I call him up and he's like, business is business. And it was just like... You got fired from your own company? I got, uh, yeah, I got terminated from my own company. And it was like basically <laughs> the most gutting moment of my life. You know what I mean? Like I have a tattoo of the brand. Like I, like, this was me. You know, I was like, I'm like, I see and why Mike, like, that's my thing. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, it was like a reckoning, man, where like I thought it was over you know i'm like i don't know what the hell i'm gonna do how am i gonna reinvent myself like well before you even get there what's the lesson in all that for the person watching is it be careful who you go into business with is it try to fund things on your own if you can like what don't rush your way to success don't try to rush your way to getting to something that's going to be easier you know because a lot of times you running to that easier thing is you running away from the problems that are facing you mm -hmm. and a lot of times for me my biggest learning lessons in life has been take a step back and take it one day at a time, you know? And like, ultimately, I think that has been my biggest thing I've had to remind myself always when you get into those tight spots or those places where you want to make a quick decision and an impulse one. Mm -hmm. And so for me, not to say that I think it was a bad decision working with the guy, but I signed a deal where I essentially had a guy financing the brand and I was making $50,000 a year. Mm -hmm. But looking back, I was like, that pays my bills. I can go buy dinner with that. I can go do this. So cool, I'm good, mm -hmm. you know? But then looking back now, I'm like, man, New York City, 50K a year, like you're living pretty check to check, you know, and you're not living some like great lifestyle. So, you know, I signed my up, myself up for a pretty challenging situation. And I also didn't know what I was doing. I was trying to build a brand with little brand knowledge, only knowing what it was like to be a freelance designer. But 
that was all the lessons I needed. That was me showing up to trade shows, trying to build cool booths, create engaging POP, trying to get like, you know, buyers engaged and excited. And ultimately I was there being a salesman every time. I was there, you know, selling who I am to people and like, you know, building this kind of persona around myself. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times it was, that was like the learning lesson. And that was the college, you know, was yeah. me having that experience. So as much as I, you know, resented that person for terminating me and shutting the company down. And, you know, that was an idea that I was really passionate about because it meant something to people. It was something that people really needed. I had other people who had been hit by cars or been in, you know, tight situations in city like environments and the brand was a solution for them. Mm -hmm. But through all of that, I got a nice life lesson of just like nothing's forever. And if you can draw it once, you can draw it again. And the other thing, too, because I read you said, you know, you took on a partner, well, obviously because of money. But, hey, I'm a designer. I'm the creative. This allows me to do just that. And I don't have to do all the other. Exactly. Right. Right now, for me, this is the fun part. Yep. This is the easy part of the job. Of right. The shitty part is paying bills and watching costs and all that other stuff yep. that is that. I think a lot of creative people run from. I'm the creative man. <laughs> you know, leave that to the fucking nerds to balance the books. Yeah. But do you feel like you have to, no matter how creative you are, do you feel like you need to at least know that side or be plugged in or to be a part of those calls? You know, even if you're not guy, the guy going into QuickBooks manually, you yeah. need to know what's there and. Yeah, because I wasn't doing that originally. It was know? that a mistake, and you think, at the that time? That was a learning lesson, yeah. Was that a, a lesson, mistake. yeah. It was like, you know, the first brand, like, I had an Excel sheet of what I spent, you know? <laughs> yeah, like, of course. But when I started Market, like, that was with QuickBooks. That was, I got a CPA really fast who was helping me to stay compliant and on point. But also, at the same token, like, I was doing freelance and essentially running a design production agency yeah. on the side to fund what I was doing for the brand. Because mm -hmm. I knew deep down, I didn't want to compromise everything I was doing for the brand day to day. So I was using all the money I was making on this side of things to fund what I wanted to do with the brand. And ultimately, the more popular the brand became, the more I would say, oh, no, you can't do that with the brand, but the agency can help you. And a lot of times I would parlay things on both sides, but no one really knew I was running production for a bunch of brands in LA or I was designing for a bunch of record labels, um, you know, et cetera. But, you know, it's a unique one because I think a lot of times it's the ASAP Worldwide logo, the ASAP Rocky stuff. I did the logo for Kith and Ronnie Fi. Oh, wow. Um, you know, we were sitting in a Soho house eating cheeseburgers and, you know, designed the logo for Kith or, you know, all of the kind of like stuff around that. And ultimately it's, you know, those are the things that afforded me the opportunity to do the brand. Yeah. Because I don't just have a ton of money. I wasn't just, you know, like minted. And ultimately for me, like I started this brand on a credit card, you know? I showed up. Market? To, yeah, I started market on a credit card. I showed up with five t-shirts and five hats. I put it all on a credit card. I maxed out the credit card to 20K and I rolled the dice. I showed up to the first complex con not knowing what complex con would be. And, you know, I remember just like that first day doing, you know, I think it was like 15K and the next day doing another wow. 15K. And then I was like, holy shit. I remember going back to the hotel room, my girlfriend who had helped me with the booth and like, you know, we're both just sitting there. That's real being money. Like, this is crazy. Like I had like, you know, probably like a thousand dollars in like in cash and I had like was on the bed. I threw the money up. Like it was one of those moments where like after all the pain, all the yeah. struggle, all that, like questioning myself, like, am I even can I do this again? Do I actually matter? Like, did anyone care about what I make? And that was like, oh, I can do this, you know, and that was like the renewing of that energy of just like, oh, I'm here and I'm here to f stay. Um, and so since that moment, I think it was just like, I'm going to keep proving to everyone, even if I don't really know if everyone's against me, I'm going to feel like everyone's against me. And I'm going to go fight like, you know, every single day is a day for me to prove who I am, why I deserve to be here. And, you know, that I love this game, you know, and like, I always remind myself, like, I don't want to smell like smoothies after work. I, I, I want to like, you know, make t-shirts and I'm pretty grateful to be able to do that. And mm -hmm. so, you know, I try to remind everyone who works for me, like, you know, I was in the exact position you were in. I was that kid making t-shirts, hoping to do this every day, but it's about how you show up and what you do every day that affects your future. Not, you know, one thing is just going to change your life. It's funny. Like, and I'm glad you kind of talked about what led you to that. Cause I think though the Frank ocean t-shirt stories are dangerous because if I just hear that story, I go, man that's all it takes is you have one good idea you make the shirt you blow up you go to complex con you blow up 
but it ain't like that. How many sh- how many shirts did you make before the Frank Ocean one? Thousands? A lot. I mean, thousands yeah. and thousands of designs, thousands of shirts, thousands of concepts. I think sometimes you realize like the most simple ones and the most you know basic executions are usually the best. And a lot of times, stuff you think about the most, the ones that you're most excited about, maybe aren't the ones they're gonna check. You know. <laughs> and so I've always found it's a balance as well as being a designer is like how much I put into it myself versus how much I'm designing for the consumer. And it's not about just removing my creative prowess or approach, but it's removing my personal opinion from like what I want to personally be wearing because a lot of times I'd be wearing just a black tee or I'd just be wearing something basic. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I'm very on my like Steve Jobs mentality where I wear this, <laughs> I wear the same thing every day. Like yeah. this is rare that I wear a different pair yeah, of pants. Like, like these pants. are these are the new pants we're coming out with uh, oh, next season. Cool. But like, you know, things like this are examples of like, you know, this is me stepping out, but every day I wear the same thing. It's easy for me to think every morning. I don't have to change. And, you know, I just want to focus on how can I make the best creative every single day? It's so. funny. You look at a lot of designers and it's the same deal. They're walking around in a fucking black t-shirt. You yeah, know what I mean? I mean and they, they got all so these much... wild, yeah, they got all these wild designs and stuff. It's like you figured they'd want to spice it up, but I guess hundred percent. I mean, I think sometimes it's like, yeah, when you make so much stuff, like I want to live a life without like graphics all over me all the time yeah. or, you know, always like wearing a slogan or a thing um, because it's just like sometimes at the base you know, rudimentary of it all, like even what you're wearing, it just has a logo on the chest because it has to. But yeah. frankly, as far as you're concerned, you like the thing because it's comfortable. Yeah, it fits you good. Know? And so that's the goal of clothes. And, you know, I think it's it's interesting being someone who makes clothes because you're constantly juxtaposed with like partly making stuff for consumers, but also you kind of have to participate in the consumer world or else you lose touch with everything you're making anyways. Of course. Yeah. So as a designer, the, okay, you got the creative side of you now. Well, actually, before we get to that, let's talk boring sh- Sorry, I'm going to bore you now, right? But this is necessary. You said before, you know, I've got to move at the speed of the internet. So a lot of the things you do, like the bootleg things and the stuff on the fly, you do have to move like that. Yep. Now, how important is it to have the infrastructure behind you in place to be able to go, I can ship that in two days? Because I have figured out the logistics and I've got my suppliers and... There's whatever always, else you need there's I always mean. nuance to it it's not as easy just to maybe like have an idea and ship it out the next morning like sure. it's a romantic thing to say okay i think that you know we've built a business in that we can probably within a week okay right now and the business has grown you know i think that it's all about creating real process which in the beginning i didn't have and i think a lot of times like I've learned it's the stuff that you do in the beginning that is going to breed success later. And if you don't practice it now, even when you're starting your brand, I implore everyone to like take finances seriously and take accounting seriously and account for what you've spent and what you're making and where it's all going. Because you get a year down the road, you're going to want to ask yourself like, what's making me the most money? What's not? What's sucking my most time and what's not? And what's making me the most money actually? And what is taking the least amount of time? Because then I'm going to double down on that because that's where the best amount of your time should be like focused. And mm-hmm. so a lot of times I'm, you know, with friends around me or people that I know can grow their business even more. That's the number one thing I'm pushing them to think about is like, how are you spending all your time? Where's all the value of your time being spent? And then how much are you making for all that time you're putting into it? Mm-hmm. And a lot of times you can pretty easily extrapolate like what you should be doubling down on a lot. And a lot of us just are blind to it because we want to ignore like what's really in front of us. Mm-hmm. So, so yeah. When you started um, Market, you were involved, you had your own company, ICNY, but you were involved working with other brands and stuff. This time around, what did you want to do different? Like you just mentioned, like setting those things up in the beginning was very important, you know, make sure whatever systems are in place and stuff. So like, what, what can we learn from how you did it the second time around? You know what? I decided not to go try to skip the steps. I decided not to go try to rush to the gold. You know, when I started ICNY, I was like, I'm going to compete against Arcteryx and Patagonia and like (laughs) all these like technical brands and thinking that I was going to be up next to all these players. But I didn't know how to make a tape seam jacket. I didn't know how to make technical wear. I didn't know what good fabrics versus bad fabrics were. So I was learning on the go, you know, and I think that, you know, with market, it was like, all right, cool. I'm going to, you know, truly do it myself. I had a vinyl cutter, I had a heat press, I had, you know, vinyls and flockings and all these different like tools that I essentially could cut on the vinyl cutter and make t-shirt designs. So I knew that if I could design it in a simple way, I could make it on those machines and I could make it myself. So a lot of the first stuff I was creating was either on those machines or it was very simple where I had found a screen printer who would do 36 piece minimums. He would allow me to make a small run of stuff. And then I made like a 
$5,000 minimum for retailers to buy my product. At the time, that was crazy, you know? And it was just one of those things where I had taken the relationship I had from ICNY, which was Urban Outfitters. I had launched the brand there. And, you know, I had hit up the buyer the first week of, you know, starting market. And I was like, hey, I want to launch an Urban. He's like, you sure? You sure you want to go do that? Like, because at the time it was a little bit taboo. People were, you know, like, oh, I don't want my brand in there. Like it's selling uh, out, sure. you know, like, oh, they're going to copy you or they're going to like buy your stuff and then just knock you off. But to me, like I said earlier, like that's what afforded me the opportunity for rappers to find this stuff for, you know, random people to be wearing it for stylists, to be putting it on their celebrity, et cetera. And that was the first time I saw a hundred thousand dollar PO, you know, wow. and I remember just like getting those first POs and being like, oh, this is how I can go fund me going to do the other stuff I really want to do. And it wasn't that I was embarrassed by Urban because I knew that when I grew up, that was where Urban I was. Urban was cool as shit. Yeah. And I think that a lot of times like people discount it because we're in streetwear and we're all cool and whatever. Yeah, yeah. And I want to go buy stuff from Japanese boutiques. But of I'm course, like, yeah. at the end of the day, man, like that's a really well curated, awesome retailer that gives kids access to style, you know, at the speed of the internet and what's happening out there right now. And so, you know, I think I showed a, you know, kind of opened the path for a lot of us in the street where to say, it's okay to be there. It's okay to do business over here. And yeah. to also say like, hey, we can be in Nordstrom. We can be in Selfridges in London. We can go be in these like large department stores, but we can also be in boutique. And there's nothing not cool about that. Yeah. Whereas for a long time, it was like, stay core, keep it small. Don't like, sell out. Don't sell out. And I'm like, you know what? The coolest thing for me is seeing millions of people being able to wear the brand or experiencing the brand. Mm -hmm. And that's the ultimate goal of doing this. I'm not just doing this so that, you know, I can have a core brand that like reflects my like exact love of everything. It's like, no, I'm trying to make this so that people can have a fun brand that they want to be a part of in a community that they are proud of. You yeah, know? when somebody's and, writing a song, they want as many people as possible to hear that song. 100%. It's the same kind of philosophy, it sounds like, right? Yeah. And, you know, for everyone, it's different, right? Like, you know, for a business like Root, it is going to be maybe less T-shirts because they're selling a two and fifty dollars shirt. But yeah. for them, it's a different you know cohort of customer than for me, where it's I maybe think about it a little bit more in how can I give people an experience that a lot of times would be ten x the price, but try to give them something that you know they can afford, be a part of, and identify with. Yeah. Whether it's you know how we treat our brand like an open book. I basically shine light on the entire employee base. Everyone knows whose people's names are. That's cool. It's not just me. It's like actually the community that exists within the office that is the entire personification of the brand. It's a people company. It's about marketing who we are. It's essentially like Fantasy Factory and, you know, Rob Deerdeck is what I'm trying to do within the DIY fashion space. I've wanted know? to interview him forever. For sure. Yeah, and like to me, that was one of the smartest you know, marketing kind of approaches because yep. we were all watching a TV show, not realizing we we're getting marketed to with <laughs> sneakers and brands, brands and energy drinks. drinks and, and yeah. yeah. And, it's a big you commercial. know, same thing for me. It's like, you know, the more and more I can show our fun, crazy world and show what, you know, all these guys who are part of our company and what they do, like that's the marketing, you know, it's not, hey, here's this cool t-shirt. It's actually about what are you a part of and what is this community that you're building? Yeah, I read somewhere and it sounded, when I think about it, maybe you were defending um, being in urban or stores like that, but you basically said like, for us to grow, we need to be in big stores. And you go, yeah, the little boutiques are cool, but those businesses aren't sustainable and won't be there five years from now. I thought about that and I go, I don't know, listen, I don't know anything about streetwear, or, you know, I'm sorry, or fashion, but why are those businesses not sustainable and why won't they be there in five years? Because there's always a cooler one or like, I mean, they're things go out of style. Or I what? think that just with it's not that I don't believe that they'll be there. You know, oh, okay. I truly believe. And hey, I might have misspoke. Right. But yeah, I believe that with a lot of those things, like those businesses are made for hyper local communities. They're never going to help you to go scale your brand in a big way. Yep. They will help you to go and make awareness in these pockets of places, which is very important and paramount. I definitely like will never say like screw boutiques like we should never sell because that's the core and heart of these businesses that's yeah. where our kid walks in and the kid talks about the brand in a passionate way he feels close and intimate and he can talk to his you know like community in a way different way than when you walk into maybe a nordstrom and yeah the person's a little bit more disconnected and he's like yeah it's a t-shirt it's 50 bucks yeah so you know i think that it's more the you just can't only do it there you know you have to diversify you need to think about the points of access and in some places like Kentucky or, you know, where like just in random places in the middle of America, et cetera, they don't have a cool store to go to. No. The coolest store is Urban Outfitters. Yeah. The coolest place to go is the mall. Yeah. And a lot of times that's what I was identifying with was like, 
I need to show up in those places because yeah, in LA, in New York, et cetera, I'm, I'm mostly actually in boutiques. I'm mostly in, you know, cool stores, but a lot of times it's like, I'm also in Nordstrom and Urban. I'm also yeah. in these places where a young kid. If you're can go in Kansas, and, yeah, you and you can discover it. my brand because yeah. you know I also recognize like while I might have almost 900,000 followers on Instagram, it doesn't mean that a kid in the middle of Kentucky knows who I am. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean that they know what the brand is. And so I have to continue to educate, continue to show up, and never assume that we are just that that brand. You know, yeah. like I have to always continue to educate and bring people in. It's kind of an elitist attitude too to go the boutique way. Because then basically you're saying like, if you're not in LA or New York, I don't give a f For sure. <laughs> you and, know what I mean? and part of that's the other side, right? Where you're going to be like, damn, I wish I could go to LA so I could go buy that stuff, you know? Or like, yeah, true. You know, and it's like the game it's of like people thing. who sell $900 a pair of jeans or things like that. It's yeah. like the I wish I could. And so and then it's, more it's like luxury shit. You're going to yeah. go buy a wallet. You're going to go buy a belt. Like, you know, and that's the game there versus for me where... You know, it's a t-shirt game. You yeah. know, it's like, how can I get a kid in through a t-shirt and then let him explore my brand through everything else? I love, how did you get the Beatles collab? Because, and dude, I, I missed out. I didn't realize you no, sell so quick. I appreciate it, man. I wanted yeah. the, uh, the yellow submarine hoodie. Yes. And I went to, I saw it on Instagram and I went to go buy it like three days later. It was gone. Yep. I'm like, I didn't realize I had a strike that quick. You know, man, I think How'd it was, you get that? I mean, a lot of that's licensing, right? So yeah. licensing has become a pretty big thing within the streetwear game where basically you can get access to most properties, right? Okay. But I think the first one that really unlocked everything for us was our collaboration with Grateful Dead. You know, I had put together- I'm a huge dead head. Yeah, time. so with Grateful Dead, it was like, I immediately it was like, I want to do a Crocs Grateful Dead thing. That They've would be insane. They've got the best merch, like, yeah. Why wouldn't Grateful Dead and Crocs have collaborated? And I'm like, this should have been happened. So brought them together. We made a cool three collaboration. LeBron wore that in the bubble, walking into the NBA finals. Shut up. Wearing a full outfit from hoodie, you know, shorts to the Crocs. What? You know, and that Your was- Your Grateful Dead collab? The entire outfit. And wow. like, you know, we had just dropped that stuff like a couple of days before. I saw that. I had a D-Day moment where I'm calling like all my employees like, guys, we need to restock now. Let's get it up. <laughs> and like within 30 minutes, we had the hoodie back up. We were selling like hotcakes and it was just going crazy. But wow. that was a moment where we were all on our phones. No one was out. We were all watching what's happening in the bubble. We're all seeing what's happening. And like, that was just a huge moment to capitalize on. But that's like, you know, exactly a reflection of like, if I wasn't, if I was a traditional brand, I would have missed that moment. I Why? wouldn't have been able to capitalize because you wouldn't have done the deal. I mean, no, it's that I had already dropped that stuff before he had worn it. Oh, I okay. already had released it online, you know, and a lot of brands would say, well, we don't have the stock. We don't have the inventory. I can't make that happen. Well, I decided to say, no, we're going to make this to order and we're going to drop this right now. That's cool. And we let it run, you know, because I was like, you know what? This is an opportunity that you don't see every day. And I want to give kids access to this thing that, you know, if I was a different type of mindset, I'd say, no, nah, I want them to keep wanting it, mm -hmm. you know, but instead I was like, you know what? I want to give people access to this experience, Yeah. you know, and that was to me the big eye opener because with Grateful Dead, I, you know, created a, you know, climbing capsule and inspired by my family in Colorado. I created a yoga capsule. We made like yoga mats and all the skeletons like doing yoga poses or, oh, you know, we made a, we bought a 1969 VW camper van, Westphalia, and I basically like fully redid it. We rebuilt it. It's on YouTube. It's a really cool thing with Donut Media, but basically like we built the whole thing, wrapped it and made our own dead van, you know, but then we made wow. merch from that van and then, you know, made things there. So wow. it's all about having fun telling these stories that are so much more than, you know, ultimately just running a transaction. It's like this collaboration with My Chemical yeah, Romance. Yeah, talk about where, that. That's, that's new. I saw yeah, that. Yeah, I mean, too. you know, for me, Were you a fan? Well, you know what? I would say that I was a light fan. I wouldn't say that I'm like the biggest, you know, My Chemical Romance fan. Like I wouldn't say that I was the biggest Grateful Dead fan. But yeah. for me, it wasn't about how can I just go take this and run with it? When we did Grateful Dead, I not only hired a consultant to be the expert of Grateful Dead and to consult with us to make sure I was keeping it authentic, but I hired freelance designers from the community. I hired people that understood it deeply. And so when I worked with them on concept, Smart. they'd help to guardrail and make sure that it felt authentic. And so now one of those designers who worked with freelance works at market and is now a designer who is here every day. But those are the types of experiences where, you know, even with My Chemical Romance, it was like, I may like them and I may have, you know, my own experience with them, but I had friends who were deep fans, mm -hmm. you know, whole childhood, went to all the concerts, I know, we're in the thing. Can, yeah. And so for me, it was like, 
I'm hiring those guys. And I hired my friend Anthony Piccarelli to just basically like design a lot of this capsule. For me, the one thing I wanted to touch on was like how iconic it was when Gerard wore this eye makeup and really how can we go in like homage that in an iconic way. And so for me, it was like taking this portrait image that almost is like an homage to what Supreme does when they do all their like portrait t-shirts and stuff like that. But for me, this is an icon that needed to be recognized. And so for us, it was like, how can we go put our little spin on that and, you know, constantly give a different perspective for a kid to be a part of that community? Because in licensing, you can go to a Walmart, you can go to Target and go see the like, you know, Pokemon with a logo above it and call it a day. It's very transactional, very basic, and it's meant for you if you're just a fan of something. But for me, it's like, I want to make it feel like you're a deep cut fan, that you really care. I'm going to try to dive even deeper into the core of what that is because for me, it was like Grateful Dead's been done 50 million times, yeah. but I wanted to do it in my way where it was like kind of bringing it into our world and having fun with it in a unique kind Same of Same thing fashion. with the Beatles. I mean, 100%. every piece of Beatles merch has been made. Pretty yeah, much. and you know what? Like it, it was like... Uh, it was something where, yeah, like everything's been done. You could, you know, do Abbey Road, you could do all this other stuff. But Yellow Sub to me felt like it was the right time with, you know, very much very uh, aligned to like Peter Max kind of style artwork. And, you know, just the era of that time, it was the right time to pull that out, especially with everything that happened in the world, et cetera. And, you know, funny enough, we're like friends with Stella McCartney, you know, Paul's wow. daughter. And, you know, her seeing and having that same reaction and viscerally being like so hyped on it, it was just like, that validated everything, yeah. you know, where you I'm just Paul like- You think Paul saw it? Maybe, you know what I mean? I mean, who knows? I don't know if that man so is, uh, is wearing a collab, but yeah, I like to think that he would, yeah. Uh, but yeah, for sure. Nice, well, man, this was a pleasure. I always have some questions too that really apply to anyone. Yep. Um, and I got some for you, my friend. I thought, I think about these, there's, there's a list, but for you, I like this one. If you had to make a million in one year and you started from zero today, what would you do? I mean, I'd use the skills that I have right now. I would go make one shirt and I'd then go make 10 shirts and I'd go sell 100 shirts. And I would, you know, it's like I would go look at the most basic rudimentary things that I know I can do, whether it's like I'm going to start selling my designs, logos, graphics. I'm going to consult for people. I'm going to go in like anything that I can then extrapolate as value, I will go out and do. I'm not afraid to go expose myself. I'm not afraid to go let people know that I failed. I'm not afraid to let everyone know that I'm resetting. You know, I think that after failing so many times, it is recognizing that you have so many skills and so many different tools at your disposal to make these things happen. A lot of times you just got to believe it enough in yourself, you know? So for me with a million dollars, it would be like, yeah, I would start, you know, almost like the kind of hand to hand, like dollar becomes two dollars and two dollars becomes four and just keep on going that way. And, you know, you'll find success through consistency. That's good advice. What's the best piece of business advice you've gotten? You know what? I think like it is kind of business, but it's applied to my life is the idea of asking for forgiveness, not permission. I think that a lot of times like no one's going to pay attention to you unless you go and make them pay attention to you. And a lot of times like, you know, I find it's things like that Frank Ocean shirt that I mentioned to you that I was on the campus of Nike the next week handing out those t-shirts to design directors and art directors. And ultimately, you know, that afforded me the opportunity to design the New York City Marathon merch, you know, for Nike. Um, or, you know, get an opportunity to design a capsule for one of their, you know, collections or just get in deeper, you know? And I think a lot of times it's the being willing to put yourself out there, take that risk um, and, being unafraid to fail. I think it's knowing when to ask questions and, you know, making sure that you reach out to people because a lot of people are so afraid to ask. People don't know when to, you know, reach out to someone. And a lot of times people are willing to help you as long as you're not asking them to do something for them that is of direct value and time, mm -hmm. you know, because if you're just asking for them to give you advice that isn't going to be taken from them, I think most people want to help. You know, I think that sure, many people have boundaries and, you know, a certain amount of uh, life energy to give out. <laughs> but I've always found that like, when I go to people with the right questions and, you know, the right approach, no one's really been afraid to help. Mm -hmm. um, it's just, you've got to be unafraid to ask and also be willing to hear no. Because a lot of times people don't want to help and don't want to support you, et cetera. But you got to keep knocking on that door and it keeps coming back to consistency. And I know some people will hate to hear that because it's like, well, I'm doing it, man. I'm doing it. And it's like, what are you doing? What do you mean? I always say like, you know, are you just like posting on your story or are you posting on your grit? Are you really exposing yourself out there or are you just kind of half doing it? You know, are you like just showing your friends your designs, but then you're not actually showing people who aren't your friends. You know, I think a lot of times like 
you got to put yourself in the position to be challenged rather than being in places of comfort. And a lot of times people would go for comfort more than they would, you know, the challenge all day. And so I think that's the big thing that people need to lean into is like, you got to be uncomfortable. You got to be very comfortable being uncomfortable. You got to be willing to go put yourself in that weird position and be out at that event, go talk about yourself, tell people what you do and believe deep down in your heart. Like you may not believe deep down that you're a designer, but you're a designer and you can tell people that. And the more you tell it to them, the more you're going to believe your own bullshit. You know, but all of a sudden, a couple of times more and you're like, I'm really a designer, I think, you know, and like <laughs> people really buy into this, you know, it's just like anything like you becoming an interviewer or anything else like us talking before. It's like, you know, we all come from somewhere, you yeah. know, and it's usually not sexy. You know, none of us are all minted. None of us have, like not all of us have parents who just have tons of money. And, you know, I was lucky to have parents who support me and are like, you know, willing to push me to go harder and are proud of me and what I do because, you know, my parents also at one point told me never to go to fashion, not because they don't believe in me, but because they saw what it did they to my dad's business, life. My yeah. dad, you know, is an alcoholic and, you know, went through like, you know, just partying and the lifestyle of being a salesman in fashion or, you know, just the shit they went through. But those things are part of that stuff that you have to be aware of and be really cognizant of the fact that like all the vanity around everything is, is fun, but the real core of all of this stuff is the work. It's the grind and all the shit you see on Instagram and all the cool parties people get to go to and the events and all that shit is just like extracurricular to me, you know? And I don't really participate in a lot of that world as much as like, you know, I don't have some Kanye crew of 10 people who are all supporting me. And, you know, I, I don't reference Kanye as Kanye, but like yeah. a lot of the guys like Heron Preston and, you know, Jerry Lorenzo who has fear of God yeah, and no, all these things, like nothing against those guys. Cause I think they've all built amazing businesses, but it's also been strategic on their part. Like they mean? band together, oh, you know, okay. Aaron supports Jerry, Jerry supports Matthew Williams. They all kind of like, you know, sure. Maybe they don't love each other all the same anymore, but yeah. they all supported each other and they've all helped to buoy the larger business. Whereas I think I had to figure it out myself. You no know? one was had there to, promoting you. Yeah. I didn't have anyone who was just like out there rocking it. Like y'all need to go put the, put on for you, et cetera. But it's, but isn't that more satisfying to do like it that way, though? 100%, you know, and, and I also don't take away anything from those people because mm -hmm. it's just different paths and yeah. different strokes, different folks. But like at the end of the day, man, like, you know, we all have our own path. And so I remind everyone, like, your path is not going to be my path, but you got to be willing to keep pushing through when you don't see the light, you know, and that light will keep on cracking through a little bit. But you may not see it for a couple of years, you know, like. I lived check to check for a very long time. I did not have tons of money. I moved to, you know, LA with a suitcase full of stuff that I was essentially went to round two in LA and I sold all of my sneaker collection, all the stuff that I owned for a $7,000 check, you know, and that paid off my rent for the next couple of months. And I was able to just live, you know, but those experiences are what afforded me the opportunity to be in the mix and to go try the thing that I loved, mm -hmm. you know, and that deep down is the core of why we all do this. It's not just to go be rich and like, you know, like, we're going to a cool party. Yeah. And like, you know, I truly deep down want to make t-shirts every day. You know, I truly deep down want to be creative every day and I'm grateful to do it. And if I can help the people around me who work for me and, you know, our community of consumers and inspire them a little bit, that's the dream. Mm -hmm. You know, we just had a class at Nordstrom two weeks ago where literally I taught graphic design for 20 kids, you know, and just basically cool. taught them how to create a graphic, create a collection, how to develop an idea, um, cheat codes to how to do things. And to me, that's so much more fulfilling than me selling 2000 t-shirts. I interviewed, uh, you guys probably know him, shoe surgeon, Dominic. Yes, Dom, good dude. Yeah, good dude. And I like, he's doing the same thing. He's got the same philosophy. Mm -hmm. It's cool. You guys are giving back. He does it with a sneaker Academy or a surgeon exactly. Academy of course. where he shows kids how to make sneakers, which yep. is bad. I'm a sneaker head and like yep. to me at 12 to be able to like learn that, that there's no school to go make shoes. Yeah. You can't no. go to college to go make shoes. There's nope. no college for shoes. There's a thing called pencil Academy in, uh, in Portland. And this guy who basically was a former Jordan designer created an Academy for sneakers. But like outside of that, there's no path. You know? He apprenticed from a boot, a high end boot manufacturer in NorCal. Yep. You know, and that's, yeah. Hey, that's there's nothing sexy about cowboy boots, 100%. right? But it taught him the ins and outs of becoming a cobbler and yeah, actually create. And a he shoe. stayed consistent because Dom is a prime example of figuring it out. Yeah, you know, nothing's perfect. We all fail a million times. And working but... in his garage and painting sneakers, just like you. Hundred percent. I was in a small corner of my friend's studio pressing T-shirts every day when I started this brand. You know, like I had an idea in the morning, I put it online, and I was pressing the shirts the next day. I was there until ten o'clock. I was there in the morning. I started this brand with a friend of mine, but two week, two or three weeks in, he was like, I can obviously tell that you're working so hard on this. Like, I know I'm not really there. How about you just buy me out? 
and I bought him out for seven thousand mm-hmm. dollars. You know, but the brand has obviously grown a lot, and I think that guy resents me out of just the fact that like <laughs> he wasn't a part of the meteoric growth of the brand. Yeah, you know, of but course. hindsight's all twenty twenty, and I think you got to be a little bit crazy to to do all this stuff because you got to do it through all the nights that you think no one cares and you got to put that chip on your shoulder to prove everyone wrong, you know? And part of me is being crazy enough to convince myself that everyone's against me because that's the way that I motivate myself. It's like me on an island trying to fight and show everyone that I can do this. So, What is the best financial decision you've ever made? I think the best financial decision I ever made was that while I was running market, especially as I started the brand, I never took money for myself. I never went and just pocketed stuff. And maybe that's not the best personal financial advice, but it's maybe the best business financial advice I've you know gotten is like, keep doubling down into you. I took all that money and I bought machines for the office that we could go make one-off stuff. I bought these print guns, this tool that brought me around the world that basically, you know, I bought this print gun that I saw a video on YouTube where a guy's printing on a wall on the floor. And it's this industrial tool that like was made for warehousing so that when people run these like pallets, they could just 1159, it came in. But I was like, oh, you could print on anything. And so I bought this thing offline. I printed on the back of my girlfriend's hoodie and the video went viral. You know, it was insane. I was now traveling the world doing these customization events with this printing tool that could print on anything. It dried in two seconds. I could put anything into the tool and then I could just print it immediately. And it was just like this huge unlock where, you know, I just found a way to like promote the brand through this tool and it went crazy, you know, but it's those types of things where continuing to engage, continuing to show people and continuing to pass over the tools and being transparent about it is what's allowed, I think, the love of our brand because a lot of people hide those tools. For me, I'm showing it all, I'm trying to kick it back and I'm trying to open that back door so these kids can get in. Because I also recognize that like, it'll be pretty irrelevant in like 10 years and I'd hope that all these kids can know that, you know, we opened the door for them and that will be the aspiration when they've left, you know, wearing the brand, they can still love the brand and they can still be part of our community rather than in most things in fashion, it's fickle, it's three to five years, you're gonna have a consumer and then they're gonna move on to the next evolution of what they wear, Yeah. so. Finally, what's the best piece of life advice you've got? Not business, but just life advice. You know, man, I think the biggest thing that I've taken away from, you know, frankly, my dad's alcoholism is this saying of one day at a time. You I'm know, sober too. It's, yeah. it's for me, like I grew up in Alateen. I, you know, did a lot of that kind of stuff. And, um, you know, like seeing what he went through, how his life kind of crumbled in front of my eyes. Like he had a very successful sales career, et cetera. And, you know, he chose alcohol and drugs and you know stop showing up to work and we didn't know you know but like through all of that i've watched him rebuild his life and you know truly personify the idea of one day at a time but for me and everything that i do i mean that's the conversation i have with him every day or you know when i call him at the end of the day i'm just like one day at a time and it's just like you know whether it's problems we go through challenges etc it's like i'm gonna wake up tomorrow and it's not gonna just be the same you know and i gotta keep on pushing and going through and that idea of consistency is directly tied to one day at a time and really just having that mentality in life because a lot of times like you know as regular people without that motto you let it all stack up. You let it all kind of get heavy. And I think life isn't easy. Life is not just guaranteed. I think that being an entrepreneur, or even just being an employee or trying to figure out what your career looks like is not easy. And I remind everyone out there that it is one day at a time and be willing to wake up every day with a renewed sense of why you're doing what you're doing. Because, you know, deep down, it's easy to self-doubt yourself and the biggest enemy is you, you know? But you got to believe in yourself before anyone else will. Yeah. Bro, this is a pleasure, man. This yeah. is really fun. Nah, thank you, big time. Hopefully you guys like this. If you like this, make sure you subscribe and turn on notifications. New interviews every Tuesday at 10 a.m. with the biggest entrepreneurs in the world who give you inspiration from the rise to success, but also, as you just got here, hopefully, real business tips that you can apply to your own life. And if you'd rather listen, check out the podcast wherever you get podcasts, The Tom Ward Show, and go to tomward.com for a free ebook and also weekly posts too with notes from my interview that week. So check it out. Thanks, guys.